evening. It's time for the visit with the person of high strangeness. Um, you know, sometimes we share stories and sometimes we share thoughts. And today I'd like to share a thought with you. Um, in this life, we seem to have a circle um, of friends and people that regardless of what you do or, or not do, these, these people, they just sort of enter your circle at one time or another. And so that's the case today. Um, my, my guest for today, she's part of that circle that no matter which way we went, uh, we were destined to meet. And uh, on also, I like to say, if you hear something squeaking, that's my camera person, Cliff. Uh, his shoes are making noise today. So uh, sometimes we have etherics and sometimes we don't. Today we have Cliff and his shoes. So having said all that, I'm going to introduce you to my guest, Catherine Peels. How are you, Catherine? I am wonderful. And I thank you so much for inviting me here today. Well, you know, as you get to know uh, more people or, or vice versa in the community, um, you know, because each time we grow and we meet new people, um, I thought it would be wonderful if they got to know you as a person because uh, even that early in, in our acquaintance, you are somewhat interchangeable, if you know what I mean. What do you mean? What I mean is, um, <laughs> you were nice enough to do an insert uh, where you, doc you gave your opinion on my mental illness show. So you were there. You also did a show with uh, uh, one of our other producers, uh, Elena Smitha. And then today we're going to do this one and then later uh, a couple of more. So what happens when we're interchangeable, universe just sort of takes us where we need to be at that moment. So I thank you for being so versatile. Well, thank you. Mm -hmm. What we wanted to do today is uh, introduce you to the friends as a person. Would you happen to remember how we met? Oh, uh, yes. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, I had gone to Canada to have my eyes repaired. I'd been blind all my life and finally got a chance to go up there and have my eyes repaired. And then I went down to Palm Springs to convalesce after that. And when I got home, I had a whole series of messages on my machine, and mm -hmm. one of them was from you. Mm -hmm. You had heard about my work and my family uh, through a network of your friends in the community, I suppose, and were looking for someone who could fill in um, on a canceled show. Mm -hmm. And I was real disappointed when I got home and got your message three days later, and I felt awful that I hadn't been able to step in and help you out. Um, but I remember calling you, and we had a fabulous conversation. And uh, you are one of those people that I look for in my life as well, because there is this beautiful synchronicity and um, connectedness that we all share. And in my life experience, I've found that those people that come into my life, even at every level. Every level, exactly. Uh, have something to share with me that's going to help me on my own journey. But every now and then you meet someone, perhaps as, you're def as you define high strangeness, mm -hmm. that immediately resonates with me as someone of value and, um, well, I, all of them have value, but a particular value and particular meaning to my course and my understandings. and. Since then, we've had several conversations and done some things together. And mm -hmm. uh, I think you're an incredible individual, and I perceive so many things about you on so many levels that it's an honor to know you. I thank you. And then, unknown to us, uh, I mean, uh, together here, uh, I met one of your brothers. Oh, really? Uh, ET. Yes. He yes. allowed me to use um, music on my show. And then, when we did the Big Mountain show, um, uh, Beaujard, uh, they give me the one at the place so I can pick shots, opening shots. And the art was gallery? This, yeah, the, the art gallery. And there, here was these wonderful paintings of an artist, um, which later turned out to be your brother. Another one of my brothers. Another <laughs> one of your brothers. So <laughs> yes. it was just a matter of time, you know, when this, this took place. So um, sometimes when we talk on a personal level, um, I want you to be as comfortable as you can, and maybe you would like to pick the time frame in which you would like to enter this conversation with bits and pieces of your life, or, or today, you know, 
wonderful thing happen. I was born. And <laughs> out. So I'm going to give you a free hand here for a minute. Okay. Mm -hmm. So wherever you're comfortable, just come on in with that. Okay. Well, I, I can see my life as sort of a series of major pieces mm -hmm. that all sort of fit together when I became conscious of how they fit together mm -hmm. um, because some of the major pieces were not as pleasurable <laughs> as others and some were extremely painful. And um, my work that all of my life experience has led me to at this point is in about understanding the human condition and most particularly mm -hmm. the sense of human emotion which is about pleasure and pain. Yeah. So in telling you my personal story um, I can't help but punctuate it with those kinds of thoughts because that's what my life has, mm -hmm. has really been about. And it's, a, it's extremely liberating to finally know that. And I didn't know that until about 15 years ago. So I guess uh, the most, probably the most important thing that happened to me to prepare me for my journey was being born to two fabulous people mm -hmm. who had a sort of utopian idea about the way the world ought to be. And both of them had experienced some severe negativities from the way the world actually was, both in family situations and world situations. So they sort of brought us this beautiful place in the Northwest and established a utopian sort of society. And um, I have here some things I grabbed from my office that are symbolic of my life. And this particular picture here is the view from our home when we grew up on Puget Sound with mm -hmm. the sunsets and it was just a beautiful place of nature to to feel completely one with nature and coupled with that wonderful uh, natural paradise they also gave us an intellectual uh, stimulation that had to do with a lot of a lot of art and creativity and music and it was it was a very non-traditional childhood in that it was um, fabulous. <laughs> I had that's that's somewhat rare because a lot of times um, uh, we we saw the tap on this the other day because you are one of the people that did read my book oh. and and how sometimes we make these detours and we're just not that fortunate to get our to get to start in one place and we just all over the place but then fortunate for you you did get a good start in one place and i really think that's the most important mm -hmm. thing because we really are designed to evolve our consciousness along certain lines and if we have love and creativity and freedom and empowerment and meaning in our lives from the very beginning we really do have a different emotional course of development and it's, it's highly moral, it's highly spiritual, mm -hmm. and it's not at all like what you encounter in the real world. So mm -hmm. um, th this right here is a, a very symbolic piece for me. I, I do these little um, art blocks for mm -hmm. gifts and, and as making money if in the I past. If I get you to hold it still, or, you know, or maybe I'll pick it up when you put it back. Uh, so, so, so would you say it was a wise choice for you to be born to the parents that you were? Absolutely. This picture captures the, the beauty and the harmony and the connectedness of my family. There, this is my two older brothers, mm -hmm. one of which is the artist that you mentioned. Mm -hmm. And that captures the initial early feeling of my reception into the world. Um, it was also really unique because I was virtually blind and didn't know it until about the first grade. Mm -hmm. So my world was unique, it was hazy, and when people would come close to me, I would feel them and be able to love them, but I would also be able to see them. Mm -hmm. So it was all about connection and being close, and it, it was very beautiful. Um, unfortunately, <laughs> that sort of utopian society, at some point, you really do have to go out and be in the real world. For the friends that don't know what that means, would you explain utopian, please? Oh, yes. I think um, a lot of people have written about the perfect society, the, the perfect community with the perfect um, educational structures and laws and that brings out the best in humanity. Mm -hmm. And that's pretty much what we had. And there are certain things that I've come to find in my own work that create that, that mm -hmm. we hopefully can 
make sure we get into our education on political structures because a lot of what's going on in that way is stifling this natural developmental progress that, that leads to this sort of connectedness and the cooperation that will support world peace. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's pretty important stuff. But it was a fabulous beginning that we all had. And then the real world sort of intervened, I mm -hmm. think. There was a, a point where I had, there were six children in my family. And when every one of us sort of entered, and I think it was about the junior high stage where we had a, we were sort of bust from this beautiful, uh, isolated retreat, type, retreat yeah. pipe. And we were really pretty much the only yeah. children out there. It was only one of the family that came quite a bit later. So we were suddenly immersed in this really awful. Yeah, <laughs> so, world well, junior type, high yeah. is pretty bad anyway, but it was, it was a, a, kind of a psychically shattering experience for all of us in a different mm -hmm. way. And I was the third of six kids, so I sort of watched what happened to my brothers, and and uh, which I think helped me a little bit. But the uh, to suffice it to say that the pains in life um, turned out to be a sort of corrective signals for me, more yeah. so than uh, some people I think tend to get caught up in the pain and the drama and and take it to its ultimate course when some of us see it and we don't want to go there so we make corrections mm -hmm. and I think one of the things that that I had going for me as a person of high strangeness although I think everyone in my family could be a guest on your show for that definition yeah, I, I was thinking about that you know and this is a it's almost like a new word now uh, occasionally I bump into it that high strangeness was written for me um, in the beginning of the book and it was defined about when you look at something to change your paradigm so there's the, real, there's the reason and there's the real reason type thing. And it's just popping up everywhere. And you well, certainly come in that category, I, you know. I love it. To me, it's like mm -hmm. you have a normal bell curve. Yeah. And normal is what is ordinary and what most people have or have in common. But then you have this whole other spectrum of human potential yeah. and human abilities. And I think the people that fall outside of normal are the most interesting and the most intriguing and have been the most beneficial in my mm -hmm. life. But that um, each one of us had a, a particular sensitivity mm -hmm. and mine, I think, presented itself as a uh, extremely heightened sensitivity to emotional tone, mm -hmm. which of course was one of the things that scripted my life to go and become an emotion counselor. But that I used to experience even in the middle of our utopian society there were injustices and there were imperfections in in my parents philosophies and all that sort of thing but i had this really deep sense of of connection with my intuitive inner voice or my emotions and every time there was something that was really unjust unjust or unfair mm -hmm. i would um i would do what my father called sulking yeah that's <laughs> a good word yeah which was sort of like running away to a special hiding place and licking my wounds. And I can remember doing, going to the top of the stairway at our house as there was a little trap door over the upstairs. And I must have been really young when I started sulking because the space is only about that big. Yeah. <laughs> and so I, I would do this thing. And, and it, what it really turned out I was doing was accessing my, my inner voice and developing a relationship with my spirituality. Now, you know, uh, I was up in Alaska one time and we met um, with a lady that was legally deaf. And myself, I don't see very good. And I know that sometimes when uh, that happens to us for a reason, because we have to improvise in places, and that's probably why it was a blessing. Absolutely. So you don't have been able to see like that, or else you wouldn't have been able to tune in like that. Yeah. I, I that think that's the key. Oh, it's yeah. you know, I my I guess my big message to everything in everyone is that there is a reason for everything, yeah. and that even the deepest, darkest, most horrible events in your life, although maybe they could have been avoided, have something to teach us that's really important about what we did to get there. Mm -hmm. And in terms of something like a physical challenge, then you're really starting to look at a much bigger, grander picture as in terms of who we really are in a non-physical sense and what's all that about too. Mm -hmm. But what, um, what I came to it from, 
I first I had my sulking place at the top of the stairs. Then when I got a little older and had the run of the yard, which was a big, beautiful one mm -hmm. acre with waterfront, it was just beautiful. I, I had a sulking rock <laughs> where I would go and sit and sulk yeah. down by my father's flower garden. But I, I guess I got more and more in tune with what I consider to be an entire sensory system of emotion. And later on, I would go to a, a tree. Um, it was a fir tree, not like yeah, that you, one. You, yeah, you requested a tree, and we found you one. So. <laughs> well, I would climb all the way to the top of this tree. I can remember um, the older I got, the more real, I guess, attached to the real world and, and bringing home all these problems and injustices and asking for them to help me understand them, and, and yet, Oftentimes, you can't teach what you don't know, and there was a reason that they had chosen isolation. So there were many times when I didn't feel like I had any guidance, and I w they would do things and say things that I thought were quite unfair. And I can remember many times leaving in the middle of the night even and, and going half a mile or so to this my favorite tree and climbing clear to the top of it and riding the wind and, and feeling a, a, such a sense of validation in that no matter what people were in my life, no matter if they were hurtful or fair or right or if they loved me or not in the moment, that I was one with nature, that there was this utter hug that would come from from feeling connected to that tree and to nature. And I used to, if I was angry at my mother and father, I would feel like I really had Orion and Mariah, the That's stars right. and the yeah. wind as my parents, but it gave me a tremendous and profound connection with nature. And to me, that's the source of what spirituality yeah. is all about. So in a three-dimensional, they would have said you was a strange child. You're absolutely correct. <laughs> uh, yeah. Oh, absolutely, mm -hmm. too. But that um, that manifested this sort of sensitivity um, that I developed through my, my sulking process. It, it manifested as almost a crippling sense of, of shyness because since I was attuning to my own emotional yeah. energy, I could also pick up other people's emotional energy. Yeah. And the, the closest that we get in terms of science and talking about that is nonverbal behavior, where yeah. somebody's posture or somebody's vocal tone. But it, it's really, when, when you attune to it, it's, it's like a, a musical language that's shouting from their body yeah. and mouth. And sometimes it sings a song they don't even know. Yeah. Th that that they're singing, let alone what it means. So the more, more sensitivity you get to your own, the more... You pick up everything. Yes. Yeah. So I would be able to enter a room and feel all that going on and, and almost be crippled because I didn't know how to say or do anything that, yeah. that could change what was going on or you fit into it. So. Yeah, some of the friends are, are familiar with that, with that type of uh, emotion or feeling and uh, because then eventually I'm going to go ahead for just a minute and then eventually as we learn how to overcome that then we can sort of tune out because if not it can really become a problem and so the friends we have discussed that and so now back to you did it become a problem for you well I think to the point that it caused maybe a degree of social phobia mm -hmm. uh, was a problem for me particularly when it came time for me to be in junior high and to interact with other people. I was like, my experience of their reality was it had so much more perceptual input for me that I really did not know how to talk to people mm -hmm. or deal with people. Unfortunately, I had a good sense of humor and yeah. fell back upon what I considered to be using 5% maybe of who I was. Mm -hmm. So I, I felt quite lonely, but I always had such a sense that it was so right and I, I shouldn't compromise what I was or try to hide it or pretend to be mm -hmm. something else that I, I hung on to it, even when everything and everyone sort of implied that I shouldn't. So. And they went to childhood, so next phase. <laughs> well, I, I think by the time I was an adolescent, I, I, I was very, the one emotion, if I started out with an emotion of real love and faith in nature and life, I went through a period of, of real darkness and anger. And I, I won't really say fear so much, although I, I do think that fear of disempowerment and fear of being disqualified as a human being drives a lot of anger. Mm -hmm. But if it's anger, that means that you're passionate to do something about it. So I, I think anger has a real energy to it. 
but we need to understand where it's trying to push us. Mm -hmm. Now, looking back on it, was that because of your childhood or was that self-imposed? It was both. both. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and I, I don't, almost don't want to say self-imposed, other than that the things that I learned from my childhood became part of my mindscape. Yeah. So my interpretations and perceptions of the world, of course, were going to be colored and filtered by that. But those were good things. It was, it was the fact that the world did not understand me. Um, the world was unjust. It was unfair. There weren't opportunities for girls like there were for boys. There were uh, so yeah, many. Well, of course not. If you fell out of the sky, what do you expect? <laughs> <laughs> you know, when people say, I don't know, I don't belong here. I fell out of the sky. I don't know where I came from. <laughs> Beam me up, Scotty. Yeah. Yeah, that type yeah. of thing. <coughs> well, I, um, I, my anger basically drove me away from uh, a lot of social structure that I just couldn't respect. I went through a time of rebellion, experimenting mm -hmm. with drugs and alcohol, in fact, drinking quite a bit by the time I was in mm -hmm. high school. I could get great grades in school, but I didn't care anymore. I would get right up and walk out of my classes. I mean, it was, I was a brat. Mm -hmm. But that, um, you know, there was even a point where I, uh, I, I spent a lot of time just driving around town trying to mm -hmm. find a way, I guess psychically, find a way out. And so I, I got a lot of speeding tickets and had a relationship with all the police officers and I even spent a night in jail. And I think that, I mean, I wasn't even 18 yet. And mm -hmm. I think that that was sort of a turning point for me because I realized that, you know, I wasn't doing myself any good by all of this. I was right in my anger that the world was too limiting and that I needed more opportunities than I'd been given, but that it was up to me to do something about it. Now, if you was that age at this time, you know, like uh, uh, some of us, we do watch talk shows and how the teenagers, they just, they go into this phase that you just mm -hmm. described, except this day, it seems so hopeless. Yes. Uh, did it appear to you the same way back then or is it, is it a different? different well, time and different place. I think that it probably appears more hopeless to children now who no, have yeah. not had that beautiful sense of spiritual yeah. connection with nature because I think a lot of us get spirituality through organized religion and there's some beautiful stuff there but there's also some extremely negative yeah. stuff there that disempowers and, and takes away freedom and intellectual opportunity. So um, when I see some of the horrible things in today's mm -hmm. youth um, I, I can sort of see the genesis of it in societies that really don't educate parents how to facilitate the best emotional yeah. development. And, and I can say that my children are that age now and that I made more than my share of mistakes as a parent. Um, but I can also be real happy that they have not had to go through that, that period of, of anger because of things that I that you learned, yeah. didn't. Well, I gave them bridges more. I tried to give them the best of that utopian world, but build bridges to the real mm -hmm. world at the same time and to teach them as much as they could about using their emotional system. And so far, I'm, I'm very, very pleased that they have gone through the, the normal sort of trials and tribulations and haven't had the negative motivations mm -hmm. that I had so much. I see, so some kind of way we got from high school to your children. <sighs> And so, uh, was, is good time in between? Uh, well, I, I think I sort of just um, gave up on my family entirely and went out into the working world. Mm -hmm. And I've had many professions. It's almost like I've lived many lives already. Um, I, I went to work for the state of Washington. Mm -hmm. Well, at first, actually, I went to beauty school, learned how to cut hair, and, and found out that you really couldn't support yourself very well doing that. Then I went to work for the state of Washington and went through a series of careers there that sort of the spontaneity and being in the right place at the right time and seeing an opportunity and using my emotional sensitivity um, got me, by, gosh, by the time I was 22, mm -hmm. I, had a, I, I hadn't gone to college and I had a job that, was, that required a college degree plus three years of experience. So, um, but that wasn't challenging enough for me either. I, I felt I was incredibly ambitious and frustrated that I couldn't find anything that fulfilled me in terms of work. So I ended up um, running off with one of the executives of the company, marrying oh, him, and, yeah. and leaving town completely to be, to, to be able to be a mother full-time to my kids rather than having to work to support them. 
We had a conversation the other day, uh, I want to use that for an example, uh, because sometimes we talk about how can materialize things. Yes. And uh, if, if, if you don't mind, you can share that. If, if you do mind, then we don't have to go there. But it was so incredible how you told how you told me how you materialized <laughs> it, these things. Well, you know, I, I really am a firm believer that we create our own reality, yeah. everything. And it's based on whatever we hold in our mind to be true about the world that perceives our, per that colors our perceptions and quite literally creates our reality on many levels, not, not just the physical level, but that might be the way that we're actually choosing probabilities to create. But that I, I was, extremely angry about the world and everything yeah. and even when I was at the top of my profession with the state and by then I married and divorced and and had one child that I uh, just sort of didn't believe in anything anymore and I wanted uh, I wanted to find the life that my parents had had and create yeah. a family with someone and out of the blue I think I manifested this man into my life yeah. who had he was he was successful he was powerful he was charismatic and he seemed to be madly in love with me and we ended up um, marrying, having a child and, and moving to Seattle. And in the course of, of that relationship, I ended up being able to explore what I really wanted to do in terms of I'd done all these other things and I wasn't satisfied. And he encouraged me to go back to school. Um, and in the meantime, I was doing a lot of a beginning sort of an exploration mm -hmm. into the field of human psychology by going to a lot of seminar classes and uh, religious meetings. I mean, any as uh, the, if the broadest spectrum of, in fact, the highly strange people were the ones that attracted yeah. me. But that one of the programs I went through was about how specifically how you can create your own reality yeah. by using visualization techniques. And of course, I throw myself into everything. And uh, when I went through that class, um, I was doing a visualization three times a day, trying to create all the different things that I wanted out of my life. <laughs> and I, I had no idea that they oh, were all. I love that story. Yeah. Well, they were all in conflict with one another. Yeah. For example, I was going to school, and I wanted to be, I wanted to get straight A's in school, and, and to get my PhD, and I wanted to live in a big beautiful house and I wanted to drive a really nice car and I wanted to have lots of money to spend I wanted to be able to take my kids on vacations and show them the world and, and open mm -hmm. the world to them I wanted to have great health great relationships great personal advancement and I was really working on conjuring up this image of all this stuff yeah. happening and uh, of course you can't go to school full-time and take your children traveling and all of the different things all that, yeah. but what was really amazing to me was that when I was doing it literally three times a day as religiously as I was supposed to be doing it. Within eight months time, my life turned completely upside down and a new course unfolded to me that satisfied every one of those things. Yeah. It was, it was a little frightening um, to think that you really have that kind of power. But what had happened was I was going to school at the University of Washington and I had just received a full year scholarship. I'd won, I won it for a, um, yeah. a contest and I, so I was on, I had straight A's, I was on that there course, and mm -hmm. but over the course of the summer, my, my husband got this job on the East Coast, mm -hmm. where he was going to be running uh, a tug and barge company down the East Coast to the Bahamas, and uh, or Puerto Rico, actually. But, um, so you got to travel? So I suddenly found myself mm -hmm. living, we went back there and, and looked for in, through the real estate market and it was oh my gosh four or five times as expensive over there and really awful awful places to live but there was I kept looking I kept looking and, and at one point I walked into this house and the minute the guy opened the door I knew it was exactly the house I had been visualizing I had left hadn't left out I mean yeah. I left out details but it was amazing right down to the color of the carpet and the chandeliers and everything was it was, it blew me away. It was the house that I wanted. And so I um, actually had to give up the scholarship there, but I had just gotten accepted yeah. at the two colleges back there. And uh, so we, I got to show my kids all of New York and we got to travel and see all the, all the art museums and the Macy Parade and all those wonderful things. And I had literally created everything that I'd asked for, but it sort of was a temporary illusion because when yeah, you're doing yeah. that sort of thing. Yeah, you need to come back here. <laughs> well, everybody uh, everybody needs to be looking toward the same goal. Yeah. And if, if there are disparities or if there are fears involved, things can really fall apart. 
and that, that, that led into the second really negative phase of my life where yeah. things did fall completely apart, where I recognized in the course of all of this that I had created the economic rewards that I wanted. At one point, uh, we were doing extremely well. We had a big, beautiful boat we would entertain on and all of this and all that, but that I had always perceived my own economic empowerment through a man yeah. instead of through myself. and due to his own issues and, and all of that, it sort of imploded in a very, very awful and, in fact, public way. So um, I was at the point where I needed to figure out how I could do my work mm -hmm. and be a single mother and yeah. support my children all at the same time. And then so I really had to sort of get busy creating avenues of opportunity. So when, when, we, uh, when you came in here a little while ago, you told me that there was a light bulb in here. Yes. How, how does that light bulb <laughs> fit in there? Well, um, sort of a main can, can theme in it? yeah, a main theme in my life has been about consciousness and, and enlightenment and yeah, let you expanding your consciousness and becoming aware of what's really happening in your life. And another theme has been I'll get it. Okay, no, sorry, let you do it. <laughs> another theme yeah. has been about perseverance and about how if you if you really know you're about something. Even if you don't know what that something is, if you hang on to it and you just keep working toward it as if you'll figure it out, that you will. And that if you have something to say, and no matter how many times you say it, if people don't understand it, you just have to keep trying to reword it or rewrite it or whatever to, to do it. And that's been an empowering, um, positive force in my life. So what I do have in this box is a symbol of both enlightenment and per perseverance. And what it is, is one of the original Edison light bulbs. Um, before Thomas Edison came up with the light bulb that we all use, mm -hmm. he tried something like 1,400 or 14,000 different filaments, which I think is the most incredible perseverance. He had an image that this thing was possible, and he wasn't going to give up until he found it, and I, I just it. love yeah. that. And this is, this is the original. Oh, my. Um, what it is, I don't know if you can see it, is, and it's a little bit broken now, it, it's a seashell. He used a seashell as a filament, and this is the wire came in at the top instead of the bottom. So it's this gives me tremendous inspiration about hanging in there and yeah. going through my 14,000 different filaments before I get my message the way I really want it to be. Yeah, how exciting. Thank you for sharing that. Well, That's thank you. Actually, the first time I've ever seen one, it's probably <laughs> last time too, you know. Thank well, you. there probably aren't that many of them around I anymore. Right? I mean, yeah, they're kind of breakable. But that's that's something that, that has a lot of personal value for me. Mm -hmm. So, and then here again, uh, like we started out in the beginning, we have uh, we have people in our lives, the synchronicity sometimes. Sometimes it takes months and years to know why a certain person came into your life and sometimes why they irritated you. <laughs> because sometimes if they irritate you long enough, that makes you make some changes. So we're all here for that, for that purpose. Well, I've, I really have found that the people that have been the most irritating in my life have been the most um, challenging for me to learn how to deal with and have been the most rewarding for me mm -hmm. when uh, teaching me about acceptance. Mm -hmm. In my work uh, with emotion, it's like there's a there's sort of an energy flow that that is both information and um, motivation that flows between people. And like if your reality and my reality are really different, I'm going to feel that in your emotional energy. And if if you are if I perceive you or what you're saying or doing as an obstruction to me, I'm going to feel a negative emotion. But what's really beautiful about that is I recognize it as a corrective signal and that I'm not fully accepting something about you. I see. Mm -hmm. So I use it as um, a corrective tool of expanding my own consciousness to really let in what you're saying, what you're doing, and what you're really all about. Mm -hmm. And that I found that there have been many people in my life, whether friends, relatives, neighbors, that you might not have chosen for friends, but the, and that there's something that just irritates you and gnaws away at you, and that without exception, if, if you sort of go within and go through a sulking process, I guess, yeah. figure out what it's about, you're going to come out stronger, better, more whole, and really in gratitude that that person shared what they had to offer with you. Mm -hmm. 
So, so now you have um, in, in Olympia, Washington, because we go to other places also, we have listed your number and you are available per phone for consultations, are you? Yes, um, I. part of my evolving process is going through doing individual counseling, mm -hmm. helping people understand about their emotional system. I've sort of moved past that and into the phase of more organized teaching mm -hmm. um, and putting together seminars and, and testing them now. Yeah, you shared with me that you're getting ready to go to a scientific uh, yeah. uh, conference, and where would that be? Well, there's a first ever conference on emotional intelligence mm -hmm. in San Francisco next month. Next and, month, that and would be, this is April, at the time of the taping, April It's actually May. May the 5th, and it's it's the time oh, you were telling me that the, the stars are all lined yeah, up, or alignment. some wonderful thing mm -hmm. like that. Yeah, so, and, and be, because uh, we do travel with, the, you know, we go to different places, the friends are always on the lookout on somebody giving a lecture that they recognize from things that we've talked about. And so watch out, um, Catherine is, is on the move here, so she's going to probably end up sooner or later in your presence because here again, when you have that circle, sooner or later, some of the friends will pop in your life too, you know, so. Well, I hope so, mm -hmm. I welcome one and all. Yeah, do you ever regret it, uh, having lived your life the way you have? Absolutely not. I think Good. that we have to go through, I, I think the most important thing is to listen to your feelings and to yeah. follow them, even the negative ones, especially the negative ones. And if, if we do that, they're teaching us about needs that we are not conscious that we have. They're teaching us about obstructions in the world that are accepted as normal. And if, if you really be honest and stay with those things, you're going to be where you ought to be. The only regret that I have is that we are not evolved enough yet as a species mm -hmm. to understand exactly what's going on with emotion. Or I would have been able to have had a different sort of educational experience and there would be more opportunities for highly strange and creative people to find their niche a much mm -hmm. sooner than yeah. to have to be motivated by pain constantly. Because the, the flip side of emotion, of course, is all the positive feelings yeah. um, that fall under the umbrella of universal oneness or joy, but that they're feelings like compassion and integrity and courage and honesty um, that fuel uh, my passion to do what I need to do and I've pretty much by using these techniques I don't experience very much negative emotion anymore and, and that's a wonderful place to be. And there's so many people that are just so scared to fail at yes. something. There's so much, so many pressures, you know, and uh, when I was, when I was young uh, everything had to be perfect because that had to do with my childhood and then eventually when we throw out the fact that it doesn't have to be perfect, it just sort of made things a lot easier. And so when we go at the beginning of our life and work our way up to here, it is okay not to be perfect. You bet. Well, in fact, it's, it's ridiculous to even conceive yeah. of perfection because life is an ongoing evolution. And the simple truth is, and this is one of the big messages that I want to get out in mainstream society, is that we learn through trial and error yeah. You cannot get the evaluation, the feeling signal, until you make a behavior that creates the feeling. That, so you have to have the trial before you know you've made yeah. an error. And so we need to look at making mistakes and having regrets about things in the past in this perspective. Because if, if we're not aware of what our emotions are doing and where they're pushing us, we will blunder our way along. We'll get there, it'll be slower and it'll be more painful, but we'll get there. But if we're in tune to this trial and error thing and we accept that, oh, okay, I created that, now I'm gonna analyze it, I'm gonna use my feeling to expand my consciousness, learn here, I'm gonna make the communications that I need to make, mm -hmm. See, it's, it's, it's basically either resistance or acceptance. Mm -hmm. If you have an experience and you're feeling a negative emotion, you're resisting some part of that experience and that very signal is saying that to you. Mm -hmm. So if you, the reason that you're resistant is that there's a belief structure somewhere in your mind that's protecting some core need you're not aware of that's being infringed upon. Mm -hmm. So 
having an experience and experiencing a positive emotion with it is more is showing you that you're accepting the fullness of the experience and that you are in control and it's leading you in a much more wonderfully enjoyable creative way toward your destiny rather than beating you with a stick of pain it's mm -hmm. pulling you with a carrot of pleasure so based on that i'm going to put you in charge of this reality uh, for a very short time, what's the first thing you would, would want to change, if anything? Um, you mean like if <coughs> I could design my own utopian society? Uh, yeah, period. Okay, um, well, my work is all about getting these ideas about the emotional system out there. First of all, the if you understand and watch the patterns of where your pain and pleasure are pushing and pulling you, you find that there are some core universal human needs that have been overlooked. Uh, the need for freedom, the need for power, and the need for connection are three of the most primal and necessary human needs. But if you can't accommodate the need for freedom and empowerment within a cooperative society, you can't have all three. You can't have connection because the anger, the, the anger that's responsive naturally to disconnection is going to pull people apart. Mm -hmm. So the reason that we have violence in the schools, the reason that we have warring companies, the reason that we have divorces and world disorder and holy wars is because we are not understanding the depth of our connection need. We can't achieve cooperation as long as we need to compete for basic power and freedom. So is the way I see life is that our next step in our evolution is understanding that we are all connected. We are all part of nature. We all have the same universal inner sense that's pulling us toward cooperative, meaningful, creative participation in life. But we are at the level still where we're sort of fighting for basic animal survival. Now, the implications of that on a legal basis are quite profound because what it's saying is that we have an internal self-regulatory mechanism to follow our own natural developmental path, to have experiences and to learn from them and to use our emotions to push and pull us in the right direction. So anything that advocates external control, morality, laws, punitive gods or governments goes against the emotional system. So what we really need to do to evolve as a species is to accommodate from the very beginning we go through an emotional developmental process where we have attachment to our parents where we experience love and if the society can educate the parents as to the importance of the entire developmental process give them the tools the education the opportunity and the safeguards to make sure that each child has a normal emotional response. By the time you're 18 years old, we have evolved the highest form of natural morality. You do not need laws. You do not need prisons. You do not need, you do not need any of this external control when you have the internal guidance system working mm -hmm. the way that it's supposed to work. Oh, that's a, it's a big vision. Let's see. At the <laughs> moment, if I had to change anything, I would make it mandatory that every neighborhood had an ice cream truck. <laughs> Yeah, little here and little here. <laughs> That's what I forgot. <laughs> Lillian, between you and me, I tell yeah. you. Yeah, <laughs> solve the problems of the world. Oh, no. Yeah. Yes, well. But, it, it, but visions like that, you know, it just, uh, sometimes the road to get there or to make people, just put them in the space where they even comprehend a small percentage. Mm -hmm. That's not being disrespectful or, uh, you know, to the listener, anything like that, but sometimes, it seems such a hard life we have chosen for ourselves. Yes. Well, it's a hard life that we are creating for ourselves. And just the fact that society accepts pain and suffering as natural. It's normal, yeah. Well, not only that, some religions advocate suffering yeah. is good for the soul. In fact, there's one of my little things from my office here. Yeah, that's <laughs> it's right. It's yeah. sort of a, a combination of, of what happens um, to the normal emotional system when it is impressed upon by external rules that are overly rigid, you get um, the combination of, is it pronounced munch? I'm not sure, the famous scream, munch. <laughs> munch. Um, and I, I'm sorry if that offends anyone, uh, but that having been, 
having been initiated into life through the spiritual school of nature, um, my take on spirituality is that all, all organized religion really does carry the most beautiful symbolic truths yeah. that are based upon the emotional system. Now see, this is the other thing. People walk in fear all the time because we live in a day and age, you know, you don't know, can I say this? Do I offend this person? Do I offend that person? Politically That's correct. That's a lot of pressure. So, so sometimes I'm just at the point where, hey, you know, make a joke out of it because <laughs> I, I don't want to live in that, in that pressured society mm -hmm. where I can say anything to anybody. Well, I, that's one of the things I adore about you, Lillian, because as, as you go through this natural emotional development that I'm talking about, you really do transcend the negative emotions and anger ultimately becomes what I call mirth, which is a divine oh, yeah. and yeah. sublime sense of humor about the pitfalls of humanity. Yeah. And that's having been driven by anger for years and years and years, I'm really proud of myself when I can be in an in a situation that used to invoke anger and I can laugh at it because I understand it. Yeah. And I also know how to take my own empowerment in that moment and do what I need to do to respond to the yeah. feeling of anger. I'm not there yet. Yeah. <laughs> I can still get mad on the freeway. And yeah, I just <laughs> came out of anger. I was in a very, very bad space because I was angry because uh, I couldn't park my RV where in the place where I own my home. And it just, it just, on the, on the it limited your freedom it and did. it took it, away your power, it didn't took, it? Well, well, yeah. And this it, is it, why your my, cooperation my, my broke down. soul, yeah, you know. And it wasn't until I eventually, with the help of somebody, uh, here, one of those people that happened, happened to come in my circle accidentally, overcame that. I don't ever there are no go accidents, there again. No. <laughs> you got um. Oh, I brought some the, things um, from my office that, that are symptom. Oh, uh, uh, one of the things that I went through that really, really dark period after my divorce and mm -hmm. um, finding my own power legs after giving them away to a, a husband, there was the most horrible year of my life was 1995, which isn't that long ago, actually. Um, and right in the middle of this horrible year, my son um, won a radio contest. Oh. And the prize was a trip for two to Belgium. <laughs> to Belgium, I mean, it wasn't like a free ice cream down the street. I was yeah. real proud of my son for, yeah. for manifesting that wonderful thing. So he and I went, went to Belgium to, mm -hmm. um, on this eight day trip that they had planned for a special rock concert and we're both, we were both real excited about the music. But that, that this was symbolic of that trip and we also took the train to Paris that day. Mm -hmm. And that, those to me were the special, validations from the universe that although I was in one of my darkest hours that I was still hanging on to my responsibilities as a parent and my responsibilities as a human being and pursuing my mission without letting go of all of those responsibilities. So there were several points where I was working a couple of jobs to yeah. support myself and having to put this sort of thing on hold and of course it was frustrating to me to do something that wasn't nearly as challenging for me. For example, when I moved down here, went back to work for the state lottery, and for the second time, did some management analysis for them, and it was it was fun, it was exciting, great people, mm -hmm. but it wasn't nearly as rewarding as doing this kind of work. Yeah, so. well, and um, what we're making reference to is here is the, the book actually that you wrote, it's called uh, Mastering Emotional Intelligence, Reclaiming the Emotional Sense. We're going to dedicate a whole hour to that. <laughs> and what we're doing today is sort of leading up to that. But, but you know, on a personal note here, I know when you're, in, when you're running these two dual rea realities, you know, it's like you think, uh, once we figure out how emotions are set up and how can we survive in that, it just becomes a part of you. Well, it so is you're a part over of here. You. Mm -hmm. And then you, we got the three-dimensional over here that I'm not doing well with, you know. So it's a trip to the Eiffel Tower that uh, sometimes can, you know, meet you back in the middle. And I do at least one people thing every day. And right now I'm watching um, every night at, at, I think it's 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning, I watch um, Judge Chandler and, uh, you know, how he 
how he gives out his sentences and how ridiculous people are from <laughs> the court. And, and I'm so grateful that I have this understanding over here because if not, I would find myself really stupid for watching this. But that's my three-dimensional thing I'm doing right now. Do you have one? Well, I understand exactly what you're saying, and I have to say that I, I'm not sure you give yourself enough credit, because the fact that you produce a television show and you interact with unique people all the time and you're really sharing who you are with the world says a lot about your ability to function in the third dimensionality, because like I said, I'm, I've been with people all my life who pretty much stayed in more of an idealistic or an isolated environment due to that same thing. Mm -hmm. So. Um, I think that you need to give yourself a little more credit, but that no, thank you. I, I know exactly what you mean too, that it's easy to get so caught up in the realm of idea and philo yeah. philosophy that you um, begin not to even maybe appreciate or want to be around other people. And then that's when I know, okay, it's time to, <laughs> yeah. but I, I literally have faced that all my life and that I've built a system around and, and and it is pursuing my own my own pleasure to do things and interact with other people. In fact, I have quite an extensive communication network with people over the internet, which I really enjoy because there are people um, really at the height of mm -hmm. their professional expertise and and then too, in addition to that sort of intellectual discourse and stimulation, I really like to get out um, and intermingle with people and just talk to strangers and deal with I love to to look at little children and, and catch eye contact and yeah. see that beautiful fresh spirit that still has all that beautiful emotional potential there and uh, so I it gives me pleasure to go out and interact with people in in just even um, incidental ways in addition to anything that's structured and social that I also enjoy no uh, I have a I have a computer, uh, did my original one crashed and uh, somebody donated another one for me from my friends in Michigan. However, I'm not an internet person. I like that physical contact, you know, uh, if we have to, uh, a smile, a hug. I totally and, agree. But I'm trying to befriend cyberspace and I'm find I'm not doing so well. Well, it seems to me then, and I haven't finished your book yet, but I absolutely adored it, and it spoke to me on so many levels. I highly recommend anyone that hasn't read Lillian's book <laughs> to please read it. It's, it's a magical piece of work. But that the, um, the story that you tell about traveling around the country in the Cropper and meeting so many people, it seems like you already have a network of people. And it would just, it would mean simply expanding that network and making sure that you know their email addresses. Uh, we, you're absolutely right. I, I'll see who's emailing me. Those are usually the ones that um, answer first. And I hear, I'm, I'm learning something. I'm going to talk this out here, fear. I'm so fearful that I'm going to become May May. What's the May? Oh. May May in my book, because the only time she was anything was when she sat on her computer. Mm. Um, from what I hear you saying, and first of all, I think it's beautiful that you caught the fact that there was fear under lying it because yeah, just that. because <laughs> fear is what stops us from living and anger is what what it, it, it at least stirs our passion to live but if we act on it without really knowing how then like I said at least acting on it is better than not yeah. but that there was this in in the story you didn't want to become the person who who projected such an uh, a sort of a negative tone in her countenance and when I was reading it the, the emotion that I connected with it was one of superiority because we oftentimes think of superiority as a positive thing yeah. um, because if we learn and we, we get degrees or we get money or we whatever the traditional values are that we, we achieve those things, we have a sense of, of self-esteem and self-worth because that's one of our basic needs. On the other hand, we, we somehow get to a point, there's a, there's a consciousness beyond that where instead of feeling superior to other people, you recognize your universal connectedness to other people and you see compassion in that just because they're not where you are doesn't make them any less or, or more yeah. than you. So that then you experience people instead of with the superiority because people read that energy from you and they don't like it. You didn't like it coming off of this Mimi person in your book because she was all about me, me, me. I'm so cool. Yeah, I'm so superior. That's the name that I picked. Uh, I love yeah, it. It wasn't her name. So I, I was thinking, let's see now. Huh? <laughs> said me, me, me. Oh, and name my Mimi. And yeah. there's another one in there. He turned out to be Oliver. And the reason he became Oliver, he 
I, I was trying to... Uh, was he all it? over? <laughs> no, he was so twisted. Oh, all over twisted. twisted. Okay. Oh, that's great. Yes. I can't wait to finish it. It's a, it's a wonderful piece of work. So he became Oliver, you know, because he was just that twisted. <laughs> that's great. Yeah. Well, the, the, the feeling about superiority to me, and I found this all through the professional community, through the academic yeah. community, is that and I played with it myself for a while, obviously, but that you get you get to a point where instead of feeling that superiority, you feel a sense of gratitude, which is a higher emotional tone, and it's it's more toward where nature is pulling us. Um, so uh, there's just so much to be learned from every feeling experience that we have yeah. during every day. Instead of being in the resistant mode that, that makes us run away, go and sulk, lick our wounds, or fight. And, and be angry and be you know do revenge to get even. The other two things that, that sort of an evolved consciousness are going to be doing is learning and expanding our own consciousness instead mm -hmm. of running away from something, accepting. In fact, the, on the pull from positive and negative emotion, acceptance is what flips one to the other. Yeah. You see, and if you hadn't been such a strange child sulking, you wouldn't be who you are. <laughs> so that's really great. Uh, we're really looking forward to you know having you come back with another topic. And um, and like I mentioned before, you are you were also guest on the Elena Smither show. Um, what subject did you cover there? Well, um, I talked a lot about, about mastering about emotional intelligence, and we took sort of a, a scientific point perspective. I had a lot of charts, and and um, she had recently had some guests, uh -huh. one of which was a biologist, and a sort of kind of staying within that framework we didn't have a lot of time to plan but it was it was a fun first start and yeah. um, I'm well, hoping so to share those wonderful. ideas. Wonderful so if they want to see the scientific you uh, then maybe they can work Elena into that and so they get yeah. meet you from another perspective and I am glad that you've ended back up in Olympia and uh, looking forward to your brothers and uh, oh yeah it's just it doesn't matter which way you go sooner or later you all can end up at my house. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. It's a great house. It's just amazing. And we have we have a great staff, and uh, they all ended up here about the same way. And I thank the staff. You're my guest, and uh, you the viewers, and come see me again next week. And you have a wonderful summer. Bye. <laughs>